Hello, my name is Professor Irene Tracy, and today I'm going to talk to you about how the brain processes pain. We're in a very fortunate position at the moment with an array of tools available to us to look at the brain from a structural, a functional, a network connectivity, a neurochemical, and a, and a resting sort of network level way. So we have these amazing physiological windows that give us huge amounts of information to understand this very complex experience that is pain. First of all, let me share my disclosures. The problem with pain is that it's a very challenging condition to not only understand at the clinical level, but also at a basic science level. Descartes um, originally proposed that it was a very simple one-to-one -one mapping between tissue damage and the experience of pain perception. However, we've learned over the years that it's a highly nonlinear relationship between nociception and perception, and the extent of tissue damage in many ways is highly not one-to-one -one or not nonlinearly related to the experience of pain. And that's because things like expectation, your mood, your cognitive state, the context in which you're experiencing pain can powerfully alter the way those nociceptive signals are processed. And the different networks and brain regions that are accessible can be very um, highly variable. And this means that the experience of pain that you actually have, which of course is a product of brain processing, pain does not arise until the brain puts it together and emerges as an experience. This can be a very different experience to what you might expect based on the extent of tissue damage. And there are many examples of that in life. So pain is this multidimensional, tricky, complex, malleable uh, experience that's highly subject to brain pace processes like mood, cognition, context, expectations. And now we tend to think of pain and the pain you access in this more complex way than Descartes originally proposed. And that is that on that journey from tissue damage to the brain, there are many points at which we now know the signals can be turned up and can turn down. And as I said before, the different areas of the brain that can be accessed can be highly variable, depending on, again, these various factors. So it's a more complex picture. And that's led to, again, the challenge of both treating pain, diagnosing pain, dealing with in courts of law, trying to develop new therapies to treat it. And that's why we're in uh, the position we're in with so many people suffering and with a great opportunity to provide more relief, but also repercussions, as we witnessed, for example, with the opioid epidemic in the USA. So another challenge we have with pain is that it is a subjective experience. It will always be subjective and by definition cannot be objectified. It's your private experience. And so the gold standard ways that we want to measure pain and will always measure pain will be to have self-report, questionnaires, rating scales, to observe behavior and infer from that. Or if you have those as not options to you because maybe it's in a neonate or in a comatose or anesthetized patient or maybe in a demented elderly uh, individual, one might use indirect physiology. But all of these are limited, they're all subjective and they can all lead to challenges in diagnosis, development of new drugs and indeed in the courts of law in legal disputes. So like many conditions, we now recognise that pain is also in desperate need of having good pain biomarkers, tools that give us objective information about what's going on under the bonnet, under the skin, so to speak, so that we can better explain why a patient has a particular pain uh, condition or particular pain experience. And we can use these tools or these biomarkers of mechanisms and of how these different factors might be changing the experience of pain to better guide us in terms of not only understanding the individual's pain more appropriately, but also then targeting the therapy. So whether it's in veterinary care, analgesic drug discovery, clinical trials in challenging um, subjects like neonates or comatose or, or elderly individuals, courts of law, there are many examples where pain biomarkers would be helpful. And increasingly, we think that we want to develop a suite of pain biomarkers, tapping into the genetics, the biochemistry, uh, the lifestyle, the psychosocial environment, and also the different types of imaging metrics that we have, structural, functional, network, chemical. And it's more in a composite way we'll put those biomarkers together. Not one biomarker will do it because pain is this very, very changeable thing with many dimensions to it. So we're going to need a suite of things to put together. And that's the journey that we're all on. And there's a couple of very recent reviews for those who are interested uh, that summarizes the field as it is at the moment in terms of pain biomarker development. Well, what holds chronic people in chronic pain? Um, we know that different patients with many different conditions, etiologies, have uh, shared symptoms. 
Uh, there's separation, but there's also a degree of overlap. So if they share symptoms, they must share mechanisms. And this is a great shift in our thinking about chronic pain. The new International Classification for Diseases for the first time will define seven pain conditions as primary chronic pain conditions, a diseases in their own right, as in addition to obviously chronic pain in other conditions, more secondary chronic pain as being as a symptom. One of the common symptoms is ongoing pain. Uh, this has been difficult to image, but new imaging techniques that we and others have developed now give us a neural understanding of what is encoding that constant barrage of, of nociceptive signals that um, really is the dominant underpinning of the most uh, problematic symptom for a patient, and that is that constant ongoing throbbing pain. But if we distill down the sort of four main areas that, for example, we've worked on to try and understand chronic pain, we can think of um, these four things as being important, not the only things, but important in holding people in chronic pain. Constant firing of those pain nerves, the constant barrage of nociceptive uh, signals coming in, the reaction of the central nervous system to that, point two, amplification, sensitization. Um, so a reaction and, and setting off mechanisms in the spinal cord, the brain and the brainstem that amplify then those incoming nociceptive signals and make the pain worse, underpinning hyperalgesia, allodynia, etc. Pain left untreated, um, let's take phantom limb pain, we now tend to think of maladaptive plasticity, so brain changes its structure and function and fundamental network uh, relationships um, and might be causal but certainly is exacerbating the pain condition itself. And increasingly, the latest frontier is really to understand who is that one in five that develops chronic pain? What is it that's different about them as opposed to the four or five who don't? What is it that makes them vulnerable and others resilient? So as the brain develops from baby through to adulthood, many opportunities to sculpt and shape it, we think now lead to resilience or vulnerability in key networks that will be almost decision making points as to whether the person might tip into a persistent chronic pain condition. Well, let's just take an example um, in this very brief 50 minutes I have, a couple of examples of where we've discovered things and then we've translated it very quickly to the clinic. So if we think about the new imaging ways to look at ongoing pain and what, which brain regions are encoding that, this obviously provides us an opportunity to potentially target them with deep brain surgery. So working with our neurosurgical colleagues in Oxford, we've both confirmed that we can see the similar brain regions encoding constant ongoing throbbing pain in a patient who has intractable pain. A particular area of interest is around the posterior insula. We then have gone in with our neurosurgical colleagues and targeted this region that again provides good connection to a network of other regions important in pain. So if you bring this region down, you'll bring down a lot of other activity. And this has proven this is hot off the press. We've targeted this novel region discovered from the discovery basic science. And then we've been able to show that a patient has gone from everyday all day pain, seven out of 10. And we've been able to bring that down to one and a half, two. It's very early data. It needs to be confirmed. We need to do more patients. But I think it gives you a flavor of what's possible by using the brain imaging, discovering something new, and then taking it into the clinic and seeing whether we can see it both in the patients as a relevant target and then to target it and see whether that has impact in terms of pain relief. Another area that we've worked on extensively has been the descending pain modulatory system. And this is a system uh, that is in the old brain part, it's in the brain stem, um, and it has two arms to it, a pronociceptive and an antinociceptive arm. You can think of it as good cop, bad cop. It's exquisitely wired up to structures like the amygdala, the hypothalamus and other cortical regions. And so it's very um, pivotal in its capability of connecting how context, cognition, mood, uh, injury might be able to influence incoming signals at the dorsal horn level through this descending system, through these um, nuclei in the brainstem, the paracoductal gray, the rostral ventral medial medulla, and at the dorsal horn level, alt alter and either inhibit or facilitate that signal. So you either completely stop it coming into the brain, you feel no pain, or you make it worse. So we now know from preclinical work, as well as a lot of work that we've done in the human brain, that an imbalance in the system, too much bad cop, not enough good cop, um, is really bad and problematic in holding people in persistent chronic pain states. So we verified that indeed, this system is on and active and responsible for maintaining central sensitization, those amplification systems that underpin allodynia and hyperalgesia. We can show its presence a range across an array of different chronic pain conditions, again, confirming that common symptoms share common mechanisms, irrespective of the etiology of the condition. And again, this being a culprit brain region and, and mechanism that seems to be important. 
we can use it as a biomarker for drug development. So we've done in, a, in an array of different um, collaborations with industry, we've been able to show that we can show modulation of signal in this region. For instance, in the bottom right figure, green is gabapentin, suppressing activity in the brainstem signal. Ibuprofen is red. We know that's not effective in neuropathic pain, whereas gabapentin is reasonably effective. And we can show in the low subject number, end of 10, that we can see good suppression with gabapentin, not with ibuprofen and not with blue placebo. And we can pick that up at a significant level on as little as 10 subjects, whereas you'd need hundreds of subjects to pick that up behaviorally. So you've got this exquisite sensitivity again, if you have um, using brain imaging in a very targeted hypothesis driven way. Just to explore a little bit more uh, that work in chronic pain conditions, this is work taken from um, osteoarthritic knee pain, where patients ahead of going in for a new knee were imaged, in, and we were able to show that a subset of patients had something more complex about their pain in their knee, and they had heightened activity, again, in that descending facilitatory arm, bad cop. And what we were able to show is then a year later, with the new knee, the group that ahead of surgery were scoring high in terms of an activity in that region with a group that was still left in moderate to severe pain a year later. So the new knee fixing the peripheral nociceptive didn't do the good job um, compared to the group that didn't have this bad cop and uh, actually had no pain a year later. So again, it gives you an illustration of verifying a mechanism in, in patients from the basic translational work, using it to stratify patients ahead of surgery and predicting outcome. And again, we're following up with our neurosurgeons on this work. The good cop is, of course, terrific, and this is what we use in our everyday analgesia. And so many experiments by us and others have shown that this is when you um, are distracted from pain, you know, in sports, high arousal, distracting your child from the vaccine jab. Um, this system is the system that's switched on. Good cop activates. You flood the system with endogenous opioids. You block the nociceptive signals in the dorsal horn. Less goes into the brain. You feel less pain. And indeed, this is the fundamental underpinning of placebo analgesia. And so this has been shown uh, again in an array of experiments to be what placebo analgesia uses. There's nothing special or different about it. It just hijacks that system. So how can we use that more intelligently? Well, you can't give your patients placebo pills um, and, and saline injections. But of course, a placebo manipulation is just changing expectations. And that's what happens when a patient comes into the consult room with you as healthcare professionals. You manage their expectations and you give them a treatment. What you might not realize is it's actually the combination of those two things that drives the outcome. So in an experiment several years ago, we proved how powerful your expectation setting was. This is a brain in response to pain, um, not on drug. And then what we did in this experiment is we started an infusion of remifentanil. As you know, it's a very good acute opioid uh, in terms of acute pain suppression. And what we just manipulated was whether the subjects knew whether they were having the drug or not. So the first brain is the brain suppressed when the drug goes in, but they don't know. So this hidden analgesia, and they had about a one point in a 10 point scale reduction. When we told them the drug was starting, which of course it already had for 10 minutes, but they mounted positive expectation, you got for free all this extra brain suppression and another two points of analgesia. And when you pretended you stopped the infusion, so you mounted anxiety or negative expectation, and we call that nocebo, while still leaving the drug on, the brain went back to baseline levels and the pain ratings went back up to baseline levels as if the drug wasn't even there. It's extraordinary. So it just shows you that your expectations are actually more powerful than one of the most powerful acute analgesics we've got. And we should be using this more intelligently in the clinical setting. So of course, there is the placebo side still to further. And one of the areas I think that's most interesting in the pain field to think about is surgery. Surgery does not require um, a sham or control arm to prove its efficacy. This is very different to drug discovery, which does in any analgesic clinical trial. So we assume that the mechanism that the surgeons are using to treat the pain is indeed working. Well, if you challenge that, so let's take a, a very common shoulder pain condition, where a bone spur on the acronym joint is shaved off and you actually do, which my colleagues in Oxford did and we collaborated with them, uh, a proper um, no treatment arm and then two treatments arm, one sham surgery, one real surgery, and find out whether actually there is anything mechanistically that the surgery is doing over and above placebo, you actually discover it isn't. There is no difference in six months or 12 months outcome in terms of pain as to whether the patients had sham surgery or real surgery. And it therefore shows that there is a placebo manipulation. Now we can get into the Q&A as to how one uses that information and what one should be doing therefore with these. But certainly I think it calls us to question that when you are doing a surgery for a subjective outcome like pain, you really have to have a control shower arm in there to be sure that your surgery is doing what it says on the can.
Maladaptive plasticity is another area that I spoke about um, before. It was the poster child, really, um, in phantom limb pain. Um, some very recent work that, uh, again, colleagues and I have been working on is to show that uh, there's actually a slight variation in our thinking on this one. The actual representation of the brain um, in the deprived cortex that's missing the limb is perfectly healthy, actually, if you get the subjects and the amputees to imagine moving that limb. It actually looks no different to control. So that's a bit different to what we thought before, where we thought shifts was what was driving the pain. What we found is that that wasn't what was driving the pain. What was driving the pain was the disconnection of that region, not talking to the other side of the brain, which normally would happen. So this normal cross-colossal conversation. And the more it was just sitting there isolated, not talking, the more pain the amputee had. So if we use now a non-invasive brain stimulation technique and correct that conversation, drive that brain region to start talking again to the other side, can we correct the pain? And in a 20 minute zapping, we were able to immediately produce pain relief that staggeringly lasted for two weeks. Again, early data needs to be replicated, more studies need to be done, but it is another illustration of how you can take a new discovery about the science of pain from brain networks combine it with, again, in this case, a, a non-invasive brain stimulation technique and get incredible and slightly unexpected uh, pain relief and terrific outcomes for patients. So again, more refinement needs to be done, more validation needs to be done, but I thought I'd share that with you. The final frontier is, again, the risk factors for chronic pain. So we tend to understand a little bit more about this now, and this is a new area of work uh, to take forward. We think that the reward systems, learning systems, and the and the brainstem descending modulatory systems are the target areas that probably have gone wrong in that evolution and development. So it could be that um, we can better now identify who's likely to develop, for instance, persistent um, post-operative pain, maybe persistent pain after chemotherapy. Maybe if they're going to get diabetes, are they likely to get a neuropathy and persistent uh, pain with it? And again, we have some data um, in chemotherapy-induced peripheral painful neuropathy to support that conjecture. So going forward, we're going to be using big data sets, uh, things like UK Biobank with 100,000 brains, um, very well genotyped and phenotyped uh, individuals who are going to be monitored over time so that we can test our hypothesis about what makes people vulnerable or resilient to developing chronic pain. So that's a whirlwind tour in 50 minutes. The most important slide is this one to thank my terrific team, um, all the people I have had the great honor to work with over the years. Uh, their names are listed here in terms of the current group, terrific collaborators that I have uh, around uh, the UK, Europe and the world. Um, and of course, all the funding agencies and past group members and the volunteers and subjects that have participated in the studies. If any of you are interested in sharing with your patients uh, a more lay understanding of some brain imaging and how it can help pain or indeed um, a little book with some cartoon pictures and, and some text to describe that, um, I've just uh, produced one here and there's several radio programs and other articles uh, that again um, are very good for uh, again a lay, a lay person and a patient's understanding of pain. Thank you so much to the organisers for the invitation to speak. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you.